And hello, welcome everybody. Wow, so wonderful to see such a large group of people here today. Uh, my name is Donna and uh, as I was introduced, I'm a massage therapist, a meditation and yoga teacher and the owner of the Gentle Place Wellness Center. And I am excited to be here with my colleague and friend, Diana, a certified health coach and also certified in applied functional medicine uh, to bring you some tools and tips to make uh, 2021 a healthier year. Something I know we all really uh, are looking forward to. So um, I'm going to start today's program with a focus on the mind-body connection. Uh, our mind is a powerful tool in our, in our journey to wellness. And um, our mind somehow ends up being in the driver's seat a lot of the time, thinking about the future and worrying about what might happen and thinking about the past and all the should'ves and could'ves that we might have done. And that brings us into a place of stress and anxiety. Never mind all of the things that are going on in our lives in the world right now that may be bringing us stress. Our own minds are a big part of that as well. So what I'd like to do is start before we go any further by inviting everybody to find a comfortable position. And we're going to do a little practice to help us move out of the place in our minds that has us in the future or the past and help bring us into the present moment, a place of calm, a place, place of presence, and a place where our body can be in its most helpful healing place. So I invite you to find a comfortable way to be seated, seated, seated <laughs> right now. So your feet can be on the ground if you're sitting in a chair or if you're sitting on the floor feeling the connection to the earth. And then take a nice deep breath in and just sigh it out with a big loud sigh. <sighs> and if you're comfortable, you can allow your eyes to just close. And bring your attention inside of your body. Just begin to notice how your body feels right now in this moment. Your mind may go somewhere else, but your body is always in the present moment. So take a nice deep breath in, nice and slow, deep, full breath in through your nose and let it out slowly. Let's do that two more times. And as you breathe in, feel the crown, the top of your head reach tall towards the sky. And as you slowly breathe out, feel your body settle down into the earth beneath you. Deep, full, slow breath in. Feeling your belly fill, your chest rise. And then slowly releasing the out breath. And now you can let go of all control of your breath. Let your eyes remain closed or gazing down towards the earth. And just begin to notice your breath. Maybe you can feel the whisper of breath at the tip of your nose. Noticing perhaps that it's cooler when you breathe in and warmer when you breathe out. Perhaps you notice the breath filling your belly or your, your chest. Just begin to follow your breath without judging it, just noticing it if it's deep or shallow, if it's fast or slow. And follow it as if you are watching the waves coming in and out from the beach. Each in breath filling you with oxygen and each out breath releasing and letting go. Each breath a new beginning. 
each exhale a releasing of tension and stress. And if your mind begins to wander to thoughts of the future or the past, as it is definitely want to do, that's okay. When you notice that, just come back to focusing on your breath. The breath is our constant companion from the moment we're born until we pass through. It is a tool that is with us every moment of every day to help us ground, center, and become present. Our breath is always in the present moment. <clears throat> Coming back to your breath, letting your belly fill with one more deep, full breath in, letting it rise all the way up to your shoulders and letting it out with a sigh. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then you can open your eyes, coming back into the room where you're sitting back into our group <clears throat> and just notice how you feel. Do you feel any, any different, any more relaxed? I do. I was a little bit nervous at the beginning <clears throat> and following my breath for a few minutes always helps me ground and feel more centered. And this is so important for our health because when we are in a place of stress, and anxiety, when our mind is running the ship and taking us into the future or the past, that stress impacts our health and our body. Stress increases our blood pressure, our heart rate, it increases our blood sugar, and it also impacts our immune system. The more we can practice moving out of that fight or flight part of our immune system, that cortisol and adrenaline that stress is related to. And the more we move into the parasympathetic nervous system, the rest and digest nervous system, the healthier we can become. When we're calmer and our, our blood pressure goes down and our heart rate goes down and our energy moves from our extremities, which we're ready for fight or flight, and instead that all that blood moves into the core of our body, nourishing all of our organs, nourishing our digestive system and our elimination system where much of our immune system resides in our digestive system and in our um, intestines. So using the breath as a tool for relaxation and stress release is something you can always come back to at any time but it might be hard to remember and without practicing it on a regular basis it may be a little bit difficult to access easily so i'm going to give you one more tool to practice with that maybe is uh, a little bit easier to remember and that you can use anytime, whether you're stopped at a red light or standing in line at the supermarket with your mask on or sitting at home, whatever, wherever it might be. And it's called the five finger breath. So it uses not only our breath, but our sense of touch and attention to help us remain in the present moment. So you can take one hand and hold it up in front of you and take the index finger of your other hand. And what we're going to do is we're going to trace our fingers and use our breath as we go up and down each finger, doing an inhale and an exhale on the journey up and down each finger. You will find your own pace to do this, but for the very beginning, I'm going to walk us all through it together and then we'll do it for a few minutes at our own pace. And you can do it with either hand and you can switch hands. So we'll start with our hand down at the base of our thumb and we'll take a breath in as our finger moves up our thumb. And exhale slowly as your hand comes down your thumb. Inhaling up your index finger. 
and exhaling down the index finger. Inhaling up and inhale, exhaling down. Inhaling up and exhaling down. And up your pinky as you breathe in and exhaling all the way down the outside of your hand. And inhaling, coming back up your pinky and exhaling down. And you can close your eyes and now begin to move at your own pace. Inhaling up and exhaling down. So let's do this a few times at your own pace. Let your eyes close. Feel the sensation of your finger as you breathe in and it moves up your finger and feel it as it goes down. Let your jaw relax. Let your breath become slow and deep. Notice if you're holding tension in your neck, you can also hold your hand down in your lap so there's no stress in your shoulders. Maybe noticing the sound of your breath. No rush, taking your time, really sensing not only your breath, but the feeling of your finger as it travels up and down each finger on your hand. And wherever you are finishing the journey in this direction on your hand. And you can just let your hands relax into your lap. Noticing your breath once more. Inviting your shoulders to soften. Noticing the sounds in the room. The sound of your breath. sensation of your legs, of your seat, of your feet connected to the surface beneath you. And we'll take one more deep breath in. Belly all the way up to your ribs, feeling the full breath and sigh it out. And then you can allow your eyes to open once more, feeling yourself connected on into the room, connected to everybody here in the Zoom room with us, and just noticing how you feel. So give me a thumbs up if you feel a sense of more relaxation since you first sat down here today. Good, good. It's very simple. It's not necessarily easy to remember, but using our breath as a tool to relax and bring ourselves into the present moment is the simplest and the oldest method of meditation that has been passed down for thousands and thousands of years. So I invite you to remember that this practice 
and um, want to invite you for one more thing to, to remember. And that is that when you put on your mask to go outside into the world, very often when we do that, when we have something covering our face, our mouth, there is a psychological shift of, that moves us into a place of anxiety, right? I mean, our mouth and our nose are being covered. It's a natural response in the body to feel anxiety from that, like we can't breathe. So next time you put on your mask, remember, breathe through your nose. Make the putting on of the mask a, a remembrance of breathing in and out through your nose. Notice if you end up breathing through your mouth naturally and bring your breath to your nose. Nice, slow, deep breaths and see if that can help shift you even in that moment to a place of more relaxation. So with that, from this place of relaxation and centeredness, <clears throat> I'm excited to now pass the microphone and the screen over to my friend and colleague, Diana Prusinski abada so she can share with us some of the other simple things that we can do in our day-to-day -day to improve our health, our wellness, our immunity, and our sense of well-being. So, Diana, over thank to you. you. Thank you so much, and thank you for that wonderful relaxation and the great tools that um, are perfect for anyone of all ages. I think I will even practice the hand breathing with my son, so thank you. <laughs> um, welcome everyone, thank you for having us. It's really a, um, an honor to be here today and to speak to you about something which I'm so passionate about and that is how we fuel our bodies and how what we eat has a huge effect on um, how we feel and um, how we feel, our energy, our uh, immune system, so many things. I have a couple slides I'm gonna just share with you. So I'm gonna take a second to share my screen. Um, a little bit about myself, Donna told you I've been health coaching, gosh, for almost 10 years now, and I've gone on to get a certification in applied functional medicine. Um, basically the practice of looking at the body as a whole unit so that um, it all works together. I, I believe that our bodies are incredible. Uh, machines that are really powerful and to Donna's point our mind has a lot to do with how our body behaves um, but that our bodies can heal and um, do so much with the right raw materials so really it's about giving our bodies the right fuel to so that they can function most efficiently and keep us as healthy and strong as possible so I want to jump in and touch on stress as Donna was talking about um, with the um, fight or flight and stress and there we go. Um, and so I'm just going to start with um, the, the subject I want to talk most about today is sugar, um, but I'll tell you why. Stress um, creates a hormone in our body called cortisol, as you can see here. And as, and as you can see, this is what I call um, a screen of hormone soup and how all of our hormones are interconnected, but that there's a direct relationship between our cortisol and our insulin. I think most people are familiar with insulin and how insulin helps um, carry sugar from our body into our cells. So that's where the subject of sugar comes in today when we're talking about stress, managing stress and staying healthy and keeping our immune system strong uh, during these times. So, um, Cortisol and insulin are directly related. A lot of times when our blood sugar drops, our cortisol will spike and um, the reverse, when your cortisol drops or if you're, um, which doesn't, that's not really a stress response. A stress response is when it's, it spikes and then your, your insulin will drop, giving you a feeling of a low blood sugar. Um, and that's why a lot of times when we're stressed, we feel the need to eat, right? Because we're feeling jittery, we're feeling hungry. I mean, among other things, there's some emotional components to it also. But that's why I wanted to bring up this point. And sugar for me, it's really been the root, of, the beginning of my journey to renewed health is taking sugar out of my diet because it is in so many foods, foods that you would not expect, places you would not look for it. It is delicious, as we all know, but it's also addicting. And it gives us a big um, 
hit, a, a dopamine hit. So it feels good. So it's a feel good uh, food, if you want to call it a food. Um, so it makes us feel good. It's addictive, but it's so not good for us. And I want to just bring this in in terms of stress. And then it's also a source of inflammation in our bodies, um, which is something that we want to keep down inflammation as we're trying to maintain our health and stay strong. So I'll move on. This is a little um, diagram that I often use to show what happens when we eat sugars. Now it's talking specifically about carbohydrates, but really it's about all sugars. If you eat something that has a sugary food, your insulin has to spike to carry it into your cells. So the more sugar you have, the more insulin you need. And then if you look over here, a lower sugar item or a, a more slowly digestible carbohydrate, your blood sugar doesn't peak as high, you don't need as much insulin, and then you level out. On the left here, this e easily side where we have the bigger spike, this is where I call the, the blood sugar roller coaster. And usually once you set out on this roller coaster, it's, it's pretty hard to get off. Um, so you're kind of, you have this high peak and then you have come down and have this really low dip and that's where some people may get hangry. I don't know if you've heard that term, hungry and angry. Um, I know that's, that would describe how I get <laughs> when I've had too much sugar and you come kind of bottom out. And so then what do you do? You look for a little more sugar to feel better and you pick yourself up and then there you are, you're up and down on the sugar roller coaster. So what I wanna to do today is just tell you about, um, bring your attention to where some hidden sugars are, how much sugar we should be having um, and, and talk about sugar a little bit. I do think it's a, something that is spoken about a lot, but I don't think we can hear it too many times because it's so important in my opinion. Um, so how much sugar should we be having in a day? This slide I took from the American Heart Association, and I like to point that out because it's not the American Diabetes Association, you know, that you would think of immediately when it comes to sugar, but this is the American Heart Association. And that's, again, because of the relationship between too much sugar and inflammation and then inflammation and how it can affect um, heart disease. So I, I just like to point that out, that it affects all of our body and not just necessarily, um, you know, in terms of diabetes, which is, I, I think, where most people think off, you know, immediately that's the first thought we have. But so I like to point out that um, it's suggested that men have 36 grams of sugar a day and women have 25. Not fair, right? Why do they get more? But <laughs> usually they're a little taller. Um, so 36 grams correlates to nine teaspoons and 25 grams is about six teaspoons. So it's about four um, grams per teaspoon of sugar, just to have that little bit of math in your mind. So sounds like enough, not too bad, but when you start to look at foods and how much sugar is in them, I think you're gonna be surprised. Um, so let's, I, I took a couple screenshots of some foods and some not so great ones, but just to make an example. So I'm gonna start with a regular bottle of Coke. I don't know um, if this is something people drink often or on occasion, but this bottle of Coke, and I don't know how many ounces this one is, but this one bottle of Coke has 65 grams of sugar in that. And that equates to about 16 teaspoons of sugar. So right there, way more than anyone should be having in a day. And that's just in this one drink. Um, I often start with people who are looking to cut back on sugar is to look at drinks because you don't think of it in, as being a source of sugar. And there often is way more sugar than you would have ever expected. So I find that this is a really easy way to begin to cut back sugar is look at what you're drinking. Um, you know, think about how many sugars you're putting in your coffee every morning. You know, what is it, six teaspoons a day for a woman? woman? Um, if you're having three cups of coffee with two teaspoons of sugar in each one, there you go. You've had all of it just in your coffee that morning or, you know, throughout the day. So it adds up really quickly. Next is um, just a regular Yoplait yogurt, just a nice strawberry Yoplait yogurt that many people think they're having a healthy breakfast. But when you look at it, it's 18 grams of sugar. So half of what a man should be having in a day is in this one little cup of yogurt and, um, you know, two thirds of what a woman is recommended. So these numbers are pretty extreme, but I like to give them just so people have a target and have a sense of a baseline on what we're shooting for or what would be an ideal situation. So um, that's a Yoplait yogurt. 
The next one I chose and the last one just to take a look at is a bar. I feel like a lot of times we'll have a bar. I know I often have a bar in my bag on the go, uh, eat in the car for a snack. Um, and this one I picked is a cliff bar. And just again, kind of a random, I tried to pick a bar that most people know of. This one happens to be a white chocolate macadamia nut. Never had it, but it sounds delicious. Um, and this bar alone, again, is 22 grams of sugar. So um, you're, you're getting some fuel, you're having some nuts, you're getting some healthy fats, but you're getting so much sugar along with it. And that's where the work comes in to try and eliminate some of these extra sugars that we don't need and finding more foods that are going to serve our body and fuel us a little bit better. So what sugar is best? When you're looking at labels and thinking about sugars, what, um, you know, there are a lot of different things. So these, you know, could be considered natural. High fructose corn syrup is one that um, we see quite a bit. Unfortunately, it's made from corn, it's extracted from corn, and it's in a lot of foods because, um, you know, corn is so prevalent, it can be made so inexpensively. So it's a cheap sugar for companies to use in packaged food. Um, it's shelf stable, there's a lot of reasons, but it's really not good for our bodies at all. So I really suggest that people stay away from anything that has high fructose corn syrup. Other sugars, dextrose, fructose, glucose, as you see, anything with an os at the end is typically a sugar. Evaporated cane juice, sugar syrup, malt syrup, those are just some other things that you might see on a label. Um, so people say, well then, what about, I'll just have an artificial sweetener, then it won't affect my blood sugar. So something like sucralose, which is Splenda, aspartame, equal, sweet and low. Um, I'm not a fan of those either because those are really just chemicals. The other problem that comes in is that um, our body is still getting kind of that sweet sugary hit. So it's not necessarily getting us away from needing that sweet taste all the time. There are some natural sweeteners that don't affect your blood sugar, similar to those, but that do come uh, a little more naturally, like stevia comes from a plant. So that is one that's commonly used now. Uh, monk fruit, or also known as Lakanto, and I think xylitol, those would probably be the, the three most common right now. So I typically suggest that when people are trying to get away from sugar, if they need to sweeten their coffee or their tea or, um, you know, have some sort of sweetener to use those because they are more natural. But the thing about sugar, as I mentioned earlier, is that it is addictive, right? And it's addicting and it creates this big dopamine hit for all of us in our brains to feel good. And so what we really want to do is train our taste buds down away from needing sweet foods all the time. So I typically recommend if you're, if you're somebody who puts a lot of sugar in your coffee, see if you can go to something like stevia and, you know, gradually reduce the amount that you need so you can get to a place where you don't need to sweeten it any longer. That's the ideal scenario. But I don't expect anyone to do it cold turkey because, um, you know, it took us a long time to get used to these really sweet foods. So just, you know, use it as a tool to gradually, you know, every week reduce it a little bit more and a little bit more and have it taste bitter for a few days and then you'll adjust to it and then you can continue to reduce. But as you look at labels, I want you just to start to notice how much sugar is in a product and how much um, in, in so many different names. The other one thing that I did not put on here that Donna and I were speaking about is something as simple as ketchup. Um, you know, one tablespoon of ketchup, pretty much any way you slice it. Uh, I, we were comparing an organic ketchup to a kind of a more traditional um, ketchup yesterday, but one tablespoon of ketchup is four grams of sugar, so a teaspoon of sugar. And it's mostly added sugars. It's not just from the tomato. So, you know, our kids love, you know, ketchup on their burgers, ketchup on their french fries, ketchup, some people put ketchup on, you know, kids especially, ketchup on everything, but the sugars add up there as well. So just um, salad dressings, condiments, another place for a lot of hidden sugars. Okay, let's see. So along the lines of looking at a label or, you know, comparing foods, I wanted to just point this out. I think this is a really interesting visual. I'm a visual person, so I like to see this comparison. Um, when we're looking at foods, I mentioned earlier that my belief is eating, you know, nutrient-dense food. And this 
pretty much sums up why. If you look and compare a pound of Oreos, <laughs> I think that's one big blue package, um, has 2,200 calories in it approximately, right? Uh, a pound of peanut butter, 2,650, and a pound of Lay's potato chips, which by the way, are my weakness, um, <laughs> 2,400 calories. Um, and so each of those, that's a lot of calories in a day and you would not feel satisfied. You would definitely be on the sugar roller coaster with those Oreos and be looking for more food. Um, but if you look to the right side of the screen, we counted up, I think it was 14, do we say 14 pounds, Donna? Yeah, 14 pounds of food. So cottage cheese, cantaloupe, apples, kale, tofu, celery, lettuce, that is the same amount of calories, but the number of nutrients that you're getting in all of that food and the fiber and all the other things, you couldn't eat all of that food in a day. Um, there, it's so much food, a pound of carrots, a pound of papaya, a pound of onion, two pounds of cucumber. I mean, it just, you, you couldn't do it. So it just goes to show that looking at calories alone isn't um, necessarily the right route either. We want the foods that have nutrients to serve us and to help us. I hope that makes sense. I'm not used to doing these Zoom presentations. I usually like doing live where I can have some interaction with people. So if I uh, drone on, someone stop me. <laughs> um, so what do we eat, right? Um, ideally, we want to eat tons of uh, vegetables. Really, if there's a number one thing you can eat is vegetables. Um, fill your plate, you know, half to three quarters of the vegetables and have a side of meat. If you're a meat eater, maybe have a little bit of a whole grain. Um, but really, you want the majority of your meal to be vegetables. Um, and if you can, eat the rainbow. I don't know if you've heard that saying before. All different color vegetables from red peppers to orange carrots. The whites and the browns, like the onions and the garlic, are super immune boosters and healthy for us. So include those, even though they're technically not in the rainbow, I guess, but we'll add them in here. Um, leafy green vegetables are wonder, wonderful. You can never have too many lettuce, spinach, kale, chard, um, you name it. So good. The deep purples, you see there's some eggplant. Um, I think blueberries also fall in those categories for fruits. Um, there's a group of vegetables called cruciferous vegetables, which are wonderful for us and help us detoxify. Those are kind of the smelly vegetables. It's the sulfur that makes them so good for us, but also smelly. So things like broccoli and cauliflower and Brussels sprouts. Um, arugula is also another cruciferous vegetable that's really great for us. Um, fruits are wonderful. Eating a real whole fruit. Oh, I meant to bring a little um, juice box up to talk about fruit and fruit juices, but um, fruit is great. I do when we're trying to reduce sugar. I think I try to limit our, our fruit servings to two or three a day. Um, berries are wonderful because they're very rich in these deep colors and eating the rainbows, the antioxidant colors that are so good for us. Um, they're high in fiber and they're low in sugar. So if you're looking for a great snack, you know, strawberries, raspberries, blueberries, all wonderful, um, a great fruit to turn to. Um, I, I like to talk about fruit juice a little bit also because that can come up in terms of the sugar content. Um, it's also another drink that's very high in sugar and some would argue, but it's natural sugar, which is very true. Um, I had this teeny tiny juice box I had downstairs. It was about this big. I forget how many ounces or what, what was in it, but um, it had 13 grams of sugar in this teeny tiny juice box that we give kids, you know, all the time. Um, it was apple juice, just to um, be clear. So this teeny tiny thing with 13 grams, which is half of what, you know, is recommended for a female in a day, a third for a male in this teeny tiny thing. So I just um, like you to consider when you're drinking fruit juice, to keep it to a small amount. The old juice glasses used to be this big. Now, if you get juice when you're out at a diner or somewhere, they're this big, they're huge. But um, you know, keep your juice to a small amount if you do like to have your um, fruit juice in the morning. I do recommend that. I also like you to think about, um, you know, when we're talking about fruit juice, how many apples do you think it took to squeeze this little teeny tiny box of juice? I mean, and I don't know the answer, maybe two or three, possibly four. Um, you couldn't, you probably wouldn't eat that many apples in one sitting, but yet here you're, you know, you would drink the juice. So I often um, suggest to people, um, 
the reason you couldn't eat all those apples is because you're getting all of the fiber and pectin and all the other wonderful things that are going to fill you up along with the sugars. So if you could transition away from drinking a glass of fruit juice to just eating a piece of fruit, um, you get so much more out of it for your body. You know, the fiber will slow down the sugars and it just gives you the whole natural fruit in one, um, in one place and gives you everything, you know, as nature's intended it to be. So I encourage you to try that as an option as well to drinking a glass of fruit juice. Okay. Let's see. Oh. Supplements. Um, this is a hot topic these days in terms of boosting our immune system. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so I will touch on, I, I just jotted down a few that are um, what I think the most important, and I did put them in order of importance. If you were to add one supplement for your immune system today, I would suggest vitamin D. Vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin, so it is recommended that you um, take it with food, um, specifically fat. I often recommend taking it at dinner time because I feel like when people are eating a heavier, a bigger meal. Um, but vitamin D is a, a readily accessible uh, vitamin and fairly inexpensive. Vitamin D3 is the form that you're looking for. Um, and there's been many studies on its um, immune, how it can support our immune system and you know fight many diseases actually along with um, colds and flus and viruses. So it's a very strong and powerful vitamin, um, especially this time of year. Um, it's called the sunshine vitamin because the only way to really naturally get it is from being in the sun. And where we live, um, we're not getting much sun these days and it's not a strong sun even if we do. So pretty much from September to May, the sun doesn't really cut it for us, even if we are <laughs> out in the sun with our skin exposed. So I do recommend most people take vitamin D. Typically, if you can start by having your levels tested by your doctor, that's a great place to start. Um, and if you're you know, anywhere from 2,000 units a day to 5,000. Some people need to take 10,000 to get their levels to where they want them to be. Um, it's a good idea to then test, you know, if you start to supplement, to test again six to eight weeks later to see how you synthesize vitamin D because um, everyone absorbs nutrients really differently. So some people may take it right in and other people may need a lot more to get it into their system. I'm one of those people and need a lot more to get it in. But... Um, so it's, it's a great idea if you can have your doctor check it before you start and after. And, um, but I think you can comfortably take two to 5,000 units a day in this part of the, um, the country where we live. The other um, one last thing I wanted to say about vitamin D is that a lot of times the reference range, when we get our blood work done, um, it'll say anything over 30 is a normal range. So just as a little aside, what a reference range is when we do have blood work done is just basically saying the average of the people in the area. And that's not necessarily what we're going for. The studies have shown that when you get your levels up closer to 50 um, units, um, when your blood levels are up near 50 is when you start to really reap the benefits of it. So um, even if you may be within a normal range, you may wanna just continue to um, take some to get you up to a, a little bit of a higher level. Uh, the next great immune boosting um, supplement is zinc. I think it's another great um, and readily available, fairly inexpensive supplement is zinc. Again, you should take it with food, um, That's but also um, very helpful this season, uh, the cold season. Vitamin C is another one that uh, we can get from a lot of foods and fruits and vegetables, um, red Bell peppers are really high, kiwi, and everyone thinks oranges, but I think actually kiwi and peppers are higher than oranges in vitamin C. Vitamin C you can take um, a lot of, you can take it actually to bowel tolerance if you really wanted to. It's an antioxidant, it's really um, wonderful nutrient also in boosting your immune system. So that's another one that you could try. Um, probiotics, if you're familiar with those, it's beneficial bacteria, similar to what you would get in eating a yogurt, beneficial bacteria that would, um, you know, to support our gut, as Donna was saying earlier, that uh, the majority of our immune system does lie in our guts. So having a good, healthy gut is a great starting place for a healthy immune system. 
So taking probiotic, I do suggest, you know, if you do want to take a probiotic, there are so many different ones out there and so many different varieties, um, you know, speak to somebody who knows about them, even simply going into Whole Foods, they're very helpful, they may be able to point you and always start low and slow, you know, start with a little bit and then increase your dose if you um, and, and just make sure that it feels right for you. And then the last one, which also ties us back to stress, is a good B complex. So some good B vitamins um, are very useful for energy um, and for also combating stress in our body. So having a, just a solid B complex is helpful. Again, you know, someplace like Whole Foods right in Framingham or, um, you know, it's, it's, you can get a decent B complex in many places, but that's another great um, supplement for immune system, general health, detoxification, all of those things. One thing I would say in terms of supplements um, and food really is that to do our best, I think quality is important, um, especially with supplements because you can get some cheaper versions, but they're cheaper because they use forms of vitamins that are less bioavailable to us. So um, again, if you can speak to someone um, to point you in the right direction, that's very helpful. Um, that's good, I think that covers. And the last thing I wanted to just address with um, my little slide about reducing stress, which is so important for our immune system and ties us back to Donna, but taking lots of deep breaths, breathing is so important. Three breaths, three deep breaths can bring us back to that parasympathetic. It, it can lower your cortisol almost immediately. Um, even if you're just bringing it down, you know, 2%, it's gonna help you. It's gonna help your body function more efficiently. Um, we really want to get good sleep, good quality sleep, which means turning our devices off and turning our TVs off and um, getting to bed at a reasonable hour. The natural circadian rhythm is if you could get your good sleep in between 10 p.m. and 6 p.m., that's ideal. Have your body set to a kind of a regular clock, you know, a regular sleep schedule is very helpful as well. Um, Make sure we're getting some exercise. If you can get outside and walk, I know it's cold, but get some fresh air. I think we're all feeling a little cooped up and um, you know, stuck in our spaces as we are, but it, going for a walk around the block, even just 10 minutes just to get fresh air and move your body is really important. Um, you can do some great gentle place yoga classes, which I have done from home now, and uh, or so many things. There's so many online options, but getting exercise and moving our body is really important for stress reduction. It lowers our cortisol as well. Um, it helps us get deeper, better sleep. So it all, you know, one thing affects another. You want to drink plenty of water. Now, this is another one that I know is tough, especially in the winter for me. I'd much rather have a hot cup of tea. Um, and, uh, but we want some good plain water. You can have hot water, but maybe just um, plain or lemon water or something like that is great, but make sure you're hydrating. And um, especially now when we're inside with the heat um, so high and warm, as I have a little heater blasting behind me, <laughs> keeping me warm, um, drinking water, and then just always coming back to that breath. That's gonna slow us down and keep us in a place of calm and peace, which, is reflected in your body also. So I just spoke on for, I don't know, too long maybe, I'm not sure, but I would like to see if there are any questions or if there's anything that you would like me to, yes, Donna has questions, or are there plenty there? I haven't even looked. Well, there, yeah, there are a few. Um, so uh, there are a couple of people who've asked about honey um, yeah. as a sweetener. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you could speak to that. Yes. So honey is a natural sweetener, which is definitely a great thing. It does have, you know, like a high glycemic index. So it does affect your blood sugar. I, um, if I'm going to use a natural sweetener um, or, you know, something that's going to affect my blood sugar, I would choose honey or maple syrup, you know, a real maple syrup, um, uh, probably as my top two sweeteners in baking or something, but it, you know, it does still have a glycemic index. It's going to affect your system. So I think it's a good choice, but you definitely, you can, you don't want to overdo it. If that's a good, if that's a fair response. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and then um, a couple of questions about um, food um, and 
sugar content. At least one was about sugar content, and that was applesauce. You talked about juice, you know, apple juice being concentrated in sugars versus right. an apple. Um, where does applesauce fall in that? I would put applesauce, I mean, as long as it's an unsweetened applesauce, um, you know, if you're, if you're making it yourself and not adding anything to it, then it's, you know, pretty much eating the whole apple. Um, but, you know, when you're, if you're going to buy a jar of applesauce, just make sure it's unsweetened, you know, everything. I mean, you can even look at your nut butters, peanut butter, um, almond butter, all of those things often have added sugars in them. Like if just, you want to look at the ingredients and know that it's just apples because that's what should be in applesauce. Maybe some cinnamon, but, <laughs> um, that's um, not going to affect your blood sugar at all. But so I would say applesauce would fall towards the whole apple. But um, again, just making sure it's unsweetened. Um, as far as um, vitamin C in vegetables content, someone yeah. asked if they have to be raw or if that vitamin C content is there when they're cooked. Um, I believe it's still there. That's a very good question. I think you might get a little more potency from them being raw, but um, you are still getting benefit from them being cooked. Okay, good. Um, drinking water, you mentioned, you know, as opposed to tea, do herbal teas count as water? Oh, uh, that's a good one. I like to think so, <laughs> uh, just because I love tea. But, um, you know, it's not like drinking caffeinated tea for sure. It's better than drinking, um, herbal tea is the next best thing I would say to water, but I do think it's important to drink some good straight plain water too. Um, but there are great benefits to herbal tea as well, so. What is the difference between uh, the added sugar versus the naturally occurring sugar in food? That's a great question. So I'm, you know, and a, a lot of labels do say that, they'll say added sugars and, um, so let's use ketchup for example. So the I don't I should have taken a screenshot of this one, but it was you know of the four grams of sugar in it, one was naturally occurring and three were added. So it's, that's saying that they're they're adding you know teaspoons of sugar in whatever form and from that list whatever you know name it had. So definitely, um, I feel much better about the naturally occurring sugars than the added sugars. Um, in something, you know, ketchup, because tomatoes are going to have some natural sugars in them. That's the example I'm using now. I can't think of anything else off the top of my head. If there's a specific food you have in mind, um, you know, let me know. But I'm definitely more comfortable with naturally occurring sugars than added sugars. And when you start to look, I think you're going to find how crazy it is how food manufacturers put sugar in everything. Like I was saying mm -hmm. to, you know, nut butters mm -hmm. and um, salad dressing, and places you wouldn't expect to find it. Right, to get you sort of addicted to their products. Well, yeah, it tastes good, right? It tastes good and feels good. Um, do you, can you speak at all? I'm not sure if you know what the difference is like from frozen vegetables versus fresh vegetables in terms of the nutrition content. No, I think frozen are great. I mean, they're just, they're frozen from their, you know, fresh state. So I think frozen is a great way to always have vegetables at hand. I always have a stash in my freezer and I always tell people like Trader Joe's a great spot to stock up on. They have a great selection of organic frozen vegetables and organic frozen fruits. It's a great a thing to have in your freezer. And if you're ever in a jam, I feel like you can pour some, you know, frozen vegetables into a pan and have a quick stir fry for dinner in, you know, uh, 15 minutes. And it's a super nutritious, great way. Trader Joe's has a lot of great things. I, I remember, you know, they already have like frozen diced onions and peppers. So you could throw that in with a bag of broccoli or green beans or something and stir fry that up and I, with some frozen shrimp or I, th I think they even already have pre-cooked chicken breast. You can just throw it in or something as a protein and you know, it's a great quick dinner. So I think it's um, a super alternative. Um, there's a question here about probiotics. Um, is it more effective to take natural probiotics than a tablet? So I'm not, I'm guessing that you're referring to like fermented foods. Possibly. Uh, I'm going to go with that. Um, in terms of natural, that is a great alternative. If you can eat things like sauerkraut, kimchi, um, 
I'm drawing a blank on others, but you know, would yogurt would count in that category too. If it's a, you know, if it's a you know, plain yogurt is really the only yogurt that I'm a fan of because of all the added sugars. Um, if you can find a way to have plain yogurt, you know, a good clean um, plain yogurt is a good choice. Um, but yes, it's a great, another pickles, you know, if you could get some real pickles, it just, you have to just be careful that it is, um, you know, good fermented products and not like a pickle, a, you know, a plastic pickle that's going to have artificial colors and added sugars, you know, you have to read the labels. There's actually a brand called Real Pickles that, is, um, that I, I like for fermented foods. Um. Yeah, someone mentioned also plain unsweetened um, kefir or kefir yep. as yep. a probiotic. Yep, great. Yeah, exactly. Um, another question is when you're counting the number of teaspoons that you can allocate in your day of sugar, um, do natural sugars count in that number? I would say no. I mean, I, I'm okay with the natural sugars. I would say if you can focus, if you can get your added sugars down to those numbers, then you're doing, you've, you've done a great thing because it's a hard feat the way sugar is in everything. So um, I would say you do not need to add or not, do not need to include natural sugars. That's good news. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so there's one more question here, which is a little bit more complex and it asks about um, oatmeal. Oatmeal as uh, potentially interfering with calcium absorption. This is outside of really our topic per se, but um, it asks about soaking the oats for 24 hours in apple cider vinegar or lemon juice. Are you familiar with this at all? Is this something I, I am a little bit. Uh, it's you know you're going to remove the phytates, um, which can then absorb with uh, interfere with mineral absorption. So yes, I think it's a great option. It, um, you know I'm not going to. It's kind of a whole nother topic for another day, but um, there's uh, nourishing traditions. Sally Fallon is a, probably a great book you can get at the library that talks all about soaking grains and nuts to remove phytates. Um, so um, that could be a great resource, um, but I do think it's a good option um, for many people and it helps break it down so they're more easily digestible as well. Um, so if you have a hard time digesting grains or nuts, um, like many of us do, it's a good way to, it kind of starts the breakdown for you. So that's not as harsh on your system. But again, um, Nourishing Traditions, it's, there's a great website. Um, if you just searched Nourishing Traditions or Sally Fallon, I'm sure you could find it. And um, again, the library probably carries a great book or two. All right. Well, we're, we're coming towards the end. I have one more question uh, that uh, perhaps you can answer. Um, and that is about zinc. Someone asked um, how much zinc you should take daily. When you um, buy the zinc, it's pretty, you know, it's a low, I want to say, I'm drawing a blank on the number, if it's 25 or 35 milligrams. It's a pretty, you know, usually the, the dosage is like one capsule. If you follow the, the bottle, it's probably pretty, um, pretty reasonable, but it's not a lot, it's not a large amount. Um, zinc picolinate is a great um, form of zinc to take, um, but again, probably just follow the dosage on the bottles. It's usually pretty low. <clears throat> All right, well, thank, because two people asked this question. Okay, and then I am, go ahead, and I was just gonna make one more recommendation. Okay. Please. Oh, well, I was just gonna say, if people are interested in looking at like cutting out sugars, um, I don't you know if you've heard of the Whole30 diet, um, and I'm sure the library has a lot of books on this, and there's a lot of Whole30 cookbooks, and you can just search. Um, also, the Paleo diet, you know, is really good about not having added sugars. So if you ever wanted to just search recipes, I usually search like a Paleo chicken recipe or a Whole30 chicken recipe or something, and those are great places to start. And again, the library probably has some great cookbooks there. Or, um, in both of those areas. So just to point people if they were looking then how to find new recipes or new ways to reduce their sugars, those are good starting points. Yeah, so to that note, I just want to say that, and we're going to show a screen in a moment about this, but Diana will be offering a deeper dive workshop. It's going to be a four-week workshop starting mid-January uh, on Monday afternoons at 1230, like this, a lunchtime uh, workshop for four weeks, where she will go into all of these things and more, and as a group, we'll work together to... Um, 
uh, looks like I can share my screen here, where we can um, all work together to um, change some of these, some of these habits. Um, it's called Nourish Yourself, Four Weeks to Improved Immunity. And you'll get recordings of each session and be a Facebook group for support. And if you didn't get your question answered here today, maybe um, you'll be a good place to get those questions answered. And uh, it's, it's a $99 workshop. It's four weeks, but it's until, until Monday, it's only $75. We have an early bird special. So you can go to thegentleplace.com and sign up for that. And if you enjoyed the meditation and you want to do more meditation, um, we offer that through The Gentle Place uh, many times a week, but we're doing a special workshop with the most wonderful meditation teacher, Lisa Campbell. If anybody on here has done any meditations with her, you know what I'm talking about. And she's doing a workshop uh, at the end of January on the 31st um, for an hour and 15 minutes focused on mindful living for your wild and precious life. And uh, after that, she'll be doing a weekly meditation class as well. So if you want to balance your stress and connect into that place in yourself um, and also deep, do a deeper dive into nutrition and health, uh, we do have some more options for you. And we would love uh, for you to join us. Um, I don't know how to get, to, oh, there it is. So uh, that would be it through us at The Gentle Place. Um, we're located in Framingham. We do have massage right now. It's also a great stress reduction reduction. We do a very safe, clean, sterilized as much as possible environment for a relaxing massage. Um, and everything else that we do is online and virtual like this. We have daily live stream yoga classes for all levels and we have additional upcoming workshops, energy healing, hula hooping for all of us who didn't get enough of that when we were young really a joyful, wonderful class with Kat Suwalski for anybody know, who knows her, and a self-hypnosis workshop coming up as well. So you can learn more about that at um, our website, thegentleplace.com, uh, on our workshops tab. 